Hello class, we are going to be discussing from the beginning of the French and Indian War until the doorstep of the American Revolution. What I want you to be able to take away from this lecture are a few of the key causes that lead to the American Revolution. We are not going to be going in depth on these causes here because ultimately the next time we meet in class you are going to be split up into groups with some of your other classmates and you are going to choose one of the causes that we discuss here and research and do a group project based on that cause. So make sure you identify one or two that you really like. That way we can split you up into groups easier next time. So our video lecture begins here in the Virginia colony. So before, so in 1750, or so our story begins here in 1754. But I really very quickly want to go back in time for a second. Before this period, the French and the English had already fought four major wars in the few decades before 1754, where we find ourselves now. And as you can imagine, war is very expensive. And so England is already sort of on the back heel at this point, and financially they're strapped. And so what we're going to see is that's going to play a key factor moving forward, and ultimately, the French and Indian War is going to cost a ton for the English and leave them with some serious problems that are going to affect the colonies. So in 1754, the Virginia colony purchased uh, 300,000 acres of land in what is known as the Ohio River Valley. They bought this land from the Iroquois, and their whole intent and purpose of this was to settle this territory. So they create what is called the Ohio Company of Virginia. And so the Ohio Company of Virginia's task is to move into this territory and claim it and settle it. As you can see based on this map, there might be a little bit of a problem with that tactic because the Ohio River Valley is part of French claimed territory and has been for a very long time. Nonetheless, that does not deter uh, the Ohio Company from moving into the territory, and they are led by a young 22-year-old general named George Washington. Yes, the same George Washington that will later become the first president of the United States. Here he is, first appearing on the world stage. <laughs> and a little sneak peek, it does not go well for him. <laughs> so they move into uh, the Ohio River Valley, and ultimately, they decide that, George Washington decides that he is going to ambush the French. And so he does that here in a little place known as Jumonville Glen. And this becomes the first battle of the French in the Indian War. And it is a complete disaster for George Washington. What happens is, he ambushes the French, and then the French... Uh, respond with three times the men, and the French and their Native American allies end up pushing George Washington all the way back, and he is forced to retreat all the way back to Virginia. George Washington is actually ultimately fired for this. So you can imagine here, in 1754, George Washington has made a huge mistake as a 22-year-old man, a very young man, and one day he's going to become President of the United States. So uh, if, there's, if this isn't a story of... Perseverance, I guess I don't know what it is, because at this point he's at rock bottom. <laughs> but that's not here, here nor there. So, what we see is after this battle, the uh, word spreads to the colonies that the French and Indian War is beginning, and that the English are once again at war with the French. And so, Benjamin Franklin is in Albany, New York during this period, and he decides to come up with his own plan in the same year. And so he calls this plan the Albany Plan of Union. And so basically what the Albany Plan of Union is, it basically is an argument that the colonies need to unite because they are stronger together and they are much more capable of survival if they work together. And that's really outlined here in this image. As you can see, each colony is represented by a piece of the broken snake and basically signifying that Broken apart, they are much weaker than if they are the whole snake put together. Ultimately, the Albany Plan of Union fails. The colonies do not agree to come together here. But the importance of this is, 
while this fails, this sets up the framework for what ultimately becomes the American Revolution. These ideas that are set out here do become a huge factor as we move forward. So while it does fail, it is not something that is completely lost. So the war lasts for seven years. It's also known as the Seven Years' War. And in 1763, when the war comes to the end, the French and the, or the English win a decisive victory, and the French and the English decide to meet in Paris, and they come up with what is called the Paris Treaty. And basically, the Paris Treaty is a massive victory for the English. The French cede all land east of the Mississippi to the English, including parts of Canada. And basically, the, this ends any French dominance on the continent. The English now have full control of huge swaths of the country now, or the continent now. So the English achieve exponential expansion because of this. The country, or not the country, sorry, the colonies have now grown in size, or almost tripled in size. If you can just imagine here, you see how big the colonies are now. Look at all of the land they acquired. So the huge problem for the English is, what do we do with all this land? Uh, so they identify that there are several problems that resolve this land. One, what do we do with it? How do we control it? And how do we deal with the massive debt that this war has brought upon us? So what happens is, the colonists decide that they are going to start moving into this territory. That's the whole reason, in their minds, they fought this war. They wanted to be able to expand out farther west, and so they are going to do it. This becomes an issue, though, because there are several revolts that take place as a result of this expansion, and one of the most famous is known as Pontiac's Rebellion. And so Pontiac is a Native American chief, and he believes the only way to stop the colonists from expanding is to start a war with them. So he has this idea that he's going to unite all the Native Americans together, or basically everyone that he can, and he's going to stop the or European expansion into the West. And ultimately what happens is he is extremely successful. And uh, through this success, he achieves a number of victories. And ultimately, England has to come to a conclusion that's going to change everything for the colonists. They basically come to the conclusion that Pontiac, they cannot keep fighting wars like this with different people, and they definitely can't keep stopping revolts like Pontiac's. And so what they decide is that they're going to come to a peace agreement with Pontiac and his men, and they are going to uh, start a gift-giving program with them again. And so the problem with this is, this stops all westward expansion for the colonists. And in 1763, the same year as this peace treaty, the same year as Pontiac's revolt, the uh, king comes down with a plan known as the Proclamation Line of 1763. And basically what this says is that any territory, or wherever your territory stopped in 1762 is where it will stop permanently. And it, that basically means that you are not allowed to move any further west than you currently are. And this infuriates the colonists because they had friends and family that died during the French and Indian War. And many of them themselves fought in this war. And they can't possibly understand how they, that the English could do this to them because they believe that this land is theirs to take. And this is an extremely important moment because this is basically when you get the start of the colonist frustration with this newfound English intervention in their lives. Because up until this point, the English had enacted a policy of salutary neglect. And this policy basically is, or this basically means that they left the colonists alone. The colonists were allowed to trade with whoever they wanted. They were allowed to do whatever they wanted. They weren't taxed. And so basically, in a lot of ways, before this period, the colonists were almost free already. They were almost their own little countries because the English had very little intervention. And if you can imagine how far England is away, especially when you can only come by boat and the travel is long, they have very little interaction with England itself. And so this policy changes, and the colonists are not willing to accept that. 
So what we see after this point is the English implement several other policies that ultimately are going to be big determining factors in the coming revolution. And I'm going to just mention these. If you'd like to use one of these as your project, please do. But uh, there's four major acts that come out of this period that ultimately lead to the revolution. The first is the Stamp Act, or Sugar Act, from 1764. The second is the Townsend Revenue Act from 1767. Uh, then you have the Tea Act, which is ultimately what leads to this event, the Boston Tea Party. And you have the Intolerable Acts. And so basically, through these acts, the colonists say they've had enough. And they ultimately, in the few years after the end of these acts, because the Intolerable Acts is in 1774, and we know by 1776, everything is going to change. So this is the end of the lecture. I hope you found something uh, or a key point that you could use. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or to uh, just talk to me in class the next time we meet. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys uh, in class.